Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my next interview is with Mila Ong Quinn, and we talk about his new film, Let There Be Light, a fascinating film. It's about innovation and and beauty. It's about wonder in the environment and hope and and, and, and collaboration. It's it's about curiosity and discovery and politics. It's it's about um, yeast excrement, actually, uh, believe it or not. Uh, We talk about the Gnostic Bible and about zero-point energy. We talk about uh, Don Quixote. And, and what actually makes up the perfect energy and how energy and how the sun used to be considered just this big burning lump of coal. How cool is that? Let There Be Light is about the fusion industry and, 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 and what works and what is going to work is kind of the question that, that Mila uh, brings up in the film. It's a fascinating film. It's, 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 about, it's a film about science, but it's really interesting. It's really fun. It's deeply engaging. And as Mila says, it's, it's, science is about getting things wrong. How cool is that? I hope I piqued your interest. You're going to want to see this film, Let There Be Light. Um, Don't forget davidpecklive.com for information about my writing and and my speaking, face-to-face-live.ca for for more interviews from TIFF and Hot Docs and and new writers and all kinds of interesting conversations going on there, and rabble.ca as well. So check that out. Coming right up though, Mila Ang Thuyen talking about Let There Be Light. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We're joined by a very special guest here with me today, a documentarian, a filmmaker, and uh, uh, a guy who's in Toronto, coming in from Montreal to talk about uh, his new film called Let There Be Light. Mila Ang Twin is with us here today to chat about the film. Thanks for your time today, Mila. Well, thanks for having me. So, so Let There Be Light, is that, is that right, out of, uh, right out of Genesis, I believe? Uh, can, you, can, can you give us a little context uh, for the film? Not, not really a biblical story, uh, I don't think. Well, there's a lot of sort of a uh, a lot of sort of references in in the work to a kind of a spiritual quest. Hmm. And one of the early characters who, in the genesis of this film, was uh, important early on but was not included, was somebody working on an even crazier form of energy research called zero point energy. <laughs> and he was kind of obsessed with the early books of the Bible. Oh, okay. And then so he kept he was he kept referring. Uh, I think he was referring to the Gnostic Bible, and he was like, there was a, on the, he was saying, it was quite funny, um, on the third day, I can't remember now, on the third day, God created the stars, but the light was before that, at, at the beginning he said, let there be light, so right. if the stars came after, where did the light come from? <laughs> so he was obsessed with that, he was like, there right. must be some right. other form of energy out there. Zero point energy. Yeah, now I won't get into that, but yeah. it's yeah. kind of fascinating, but it was also... It was kind of the beginning of the art in this film. We were looking for some kind of energy that was pie in the sky, that was beyond solar, wind, all that stuff, that was just out there. And so we were looking at all these kind of, I wouldn't say crazy, but I would say obsessed scientists trying to crack pure energy. And so, but almost everybody we found was either deluded or a charlatan, right? Because right, it's right. like there's, there's certain laws of physics you can't break, and everybody's trying to break them. Um, But then, uh, so I was working on this film for a while, and then I went to a cocktail party, and I met a woman from NASA, and I was trying to impress her. I said, I'm working on a film with the future of energy. And she said, oh, of course, you must be working on nuclear fusion and going to the south of France to see the ITER project. And I said, what's that? Wow. And so I didn't impress well, her. Well, that's kind of how I felt about Mila. That's kind of what, what's going on here. What am I watching unfold in front of my eyes? I knew, and, and at one point, and how come you've pub- ne- how come you've and never how heard come of it? I've never heard of it? You you have a publicist that appears. Sandra is it appears in the film, and she says, you know, no, no, no. She's the PR. Oh, Sabina, Sabina, thank you. She said, yeah, nobody's ever heard of this. Well, yeah, no kidding, yeah. including the guy who's made the film about it. Exactly. So the NASA woman's husband turned out to be the. Eater U.S. representative. Okay. So he hooked me up. He's actually the guy in the movie. You see him in the movie. What's, what's his name? Uh, Mark Uran. And he's, he's the one with uh, space coyotes in the background. 
Right. He, he lives in a he's, great. Is he the Back to the Future doc like no, hair no, guy? He's the guy who was former head of the International Space Station. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. near the end of the film. Near yeah, the end of, yeah, great. And he gives a great line about yeah. saving ourselves. It's a fantastic line. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, so he, he sent me to Eater for my first trip, and they, they have sort of an international press day because they're so desperate to have people write about them. They invite the press, pay for their hotels, put them up for three days, put, put on a bit of a party. You actually see a scene from that in the film. Of my, so are you saying that I could, I could get a trip to Eater out of this if you, I wanted to You probably to could. <laughs> they do it like twice a year. I think one's coming up in, in like right next week. They're actually showing the film there. Oh, is that? Oh, fin- oh congr- and by the way, congrats on that, but also congratulations on the film. I love the film. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, before the recorder was on, uh, it had a real Kleana Scottsy feel to me. You know, I, I could, I felt a little bit of uh, that that tone, and that was back in '82. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> back in '82. Talk about a kind of a, a, a mini prophetic voice. Uh, but the music is great. It's I learned so much. I felt like I was in a class, but a really entertaining class. That's good because that was if that worked, that was really hard to do. Because my first instinct, because I don't do science films most of the time. They're, you know, about, they're about... Well, they're boring, <laughs> aren't they? They can be, unless yeah. there's a story arc. Yeah, right, right. And so I wasn't, I didn't want to do a science film. I like making films about people who are trying to do the right thing, interesting things. Interesting. And an, another journalist... That's a great line. Another journalist said this about my films recently that I never quite thought of. She goes, oh, you make a film about... You make you only make films about Don Quixote characters. I'm like, oh my god, that's the films I've been working on for hmm. 20 years. Hmm. A bunch of people tilting at windmills. Right. And right. and so when I first tried to make the film, I was like, I'm not going to even explain the science. I'm going to ignore as if the science is not there and just focus on the human characters. Mm-hmm. However, that version of the film was incomprehensible and frustrating to audiences because they're like, I don't care about these guys because I don't know what they're doing. So you actually made that version. I, my first, you cut, started, my first, first cut, cut of the film, I showed it to an audience, and they kind of like, they were frustrated, because they, they wanted to go through what I went through, which is an education of, why is this even interesting? Right, right. And once you learn it, and the characters themselves, they learned it when they were kids, like, and they started an obsession. So you have to learn why it's, this form of energy is so beautiful to enjoy it. Speaking of kids, uh, do I see a thank you at the end of the film to Evelyn? Yes. Who's Evelyn? That's my mother. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You see, actually, a, a credit for my daughter as well, who helped do some of the animation I prototypes. I thought I saw another, uh, yeah, a similar yeah. last name. Yeah, And good. my mom explained nuclear fusion to me a when re- I was a kid. Uh, and okay, it, what, what kind of family did you grow up in? Nuclear fusion as a kid? What's, is your mom a scientist? My mom, we, I grew up in sort of a, almost at the time, back to the land hippie family. <laughs> but my mom had gone to medical school, and she just was a, I mean, she's just an all-around smart person. Right. So, um... I, I think it was around the time when cold fusion was in the news. Okay. And I was like, what is that? And so she just explained the principles of fusion. And it's like, it's the perfect energy and this and that. It's like nuclear fission, except it's, there's no pollution. And I was like, wow. And I, she just saw the film last week and she has no recollection of this, but it made a big impression on me. Oh, but that's then cool, for the man. next Love it. 30 years, there was nothing. I was like, right. oh, right. that perfect form of energy, I guess that's n- not here anymore. It sort of stayed in the back of my mind. So this is, uh, so I love that about about the story. I love that about the seed, the splash and ripple effect, right? The pebble on the pond. Look at that. I mean, a conversation your mom doesn't even remember. How, how brilliant is that? We could go off on a whole podcast interview about that in social change and the importance of the little things, right? And the people we meet and the things we say and the questions we ask and all of that. Uh, this this whole fusion energy thing, it's brilliant, by the way. It really, I mean, if, it, if, if, if half of what they say is true about it, it really does seem like it's kind of the, the elder wand of, of energy solutions. Yeah. Um, ni- 1946, kind of this story sort of starts. Is that about right? With Or is it even earlier than that with, with some uh, scientific... In the scientific I, I community? would say... Okay, so the premise of, of the idea is we're trying to replicate what the sun does. A, bu- a bucket of water. <laughs> yeah. I, lo- I love that moment in the film. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Basically, what we have in here will, you know, will save us. This, the, in a bucket of water. In a bucket so of water. Basically, they're trying to replicate the sun, how the sun works, which is something we didn't understand at all. It was like... It, that should be easy. It was... People <laughs> thought it was like a lumping, burn, burning lump of coal. Right. And they're, and they're like, then it doesn't... Even Darwin was, was uh, flummoxed by this. He was like, how, how could uh, the planet exist for billions of years if something is burning like coal it would have burnt out by now it would have burned out by now so yeah. something can burn for maybe a million years or a thousand years but then they figured it out in 1920 and ever since that it's been the holy grail of energy it's like 
oh, we understand what it is. And so around the 20s is when we first got the idea and then it took off. And it really took off after we understood everything about uh, nuclear um, energy in general. So Einstein and E equals MC squared. Yep. That sort of triggered all the thoughts. So the research really took off after World War II. So, so um, clean energy, dirty energy is a fair uh, statement in this, in this, not only in this film, but, but in the science behind it and, and what they're discovering about the way nature works. Mm -hmm. When these molecules come together, it's not about a nuclear kind of dystopic sort of place we're going to. We're actually going to a very hopeful uh, um, place that, that, well, we're going to... Brighter sunlight yeah. <laughs> exists in the fusion in the fusion exactly. uh, driven in, uh, universe. Yeah, right. So is that fair? It's basically instead of something that is is using uranium or plutonium to make nuclear energy, you're using high elements, light elements, hydrogen or helium, and you're fusing them together. And there's very little radioactive waste. You know, the kind of waste that dissipates after less than 100 years. Right. It's very, trace amounts. You know what's so beautiful to me is the, uh, the the two molecules come together, it creates helium. Isn't helium what, when you, kids at birthday parties, right? They yeah. suck it in and they get this high voice and yeah. they just think of clowns and like, <laughs> and like so many of the scientists you interview, man, they're probably doing cl a clown act on the side, some of those guys. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, really quite marvelous, the, the collection of people that you brought together. Where are all the women, for heaven's sakes? Where are all, all the, the women? women scientists. You know, um, I, I mean, they're there for sure, but but it, yeah. is it just that particular? In general, the fusion community hasn't renewed itself mm. since. Like these guys are seventy years old yeah. or something, yeah, sixty sure. years old, and so you haven't seen an influx of young people in a while because the fusion industry has been, I wouldn't say suppressed, but has been, it's been depressed. Right. For, since nice. around the 80s or 90s. And now we're seeing, if you go to younger places, so that's why I went to places like in Germany yep. at the W7X experiment where you, do, you see uh, a woman in charge of the country who's a physicist, Angela Merkel, she's a trained physicist, and then you have the head of the industry. Uh, um, Much like Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you have the head over there who, who's a very strong uh, physicist running the place. And you have a lot of young people, and that's by mm. her design. She brings in young people, uh, diverse people from around the world, because you, she realizes you need that. And at one point, I did have a version of the film where it was like so many gray-looking old men who were depressed, and they said, if you show this version of the film, you're going to put back science enrollment for right. years and years, because right. nobody right. wants to work with those guys. Yeah, spe <laughs> speaking of depressed, right? Yeah. yeah. I love the line, um, uh, something like, before we die on our excrement-like yeast molecules. Can you tell us what, what, what pray tell, that, that means? Well, that's Mark Henderson's favorite concept. He basically gives the analogy that how, if you put yeast in a bowl, it has no forethought. It just eats up the sugar in the environment to make a dough, basically, and just yep. eats and eats until it's all gone, and then it dies. And he's like, humans are kind of like that. Individually, we're smart, but as a group, that's what we're doing. So he's kind of obsessed with that idea. And it's kind of the other theme in my film is like, who among us has the forethought to think 50 years in the future, right. let alone 100 years? And as far as we can see, people can think of one generation ahead of them, their kids maybe, their kids' education, or their mortgage. They're, I can pay off a mortgage in 30 years. That's like a deep thought. For sure, us. sure. Yeah. But politicians thinking 50 years ahead, 100 years ahead, oil companies thinking that far ahead, it's like kind of, it's who's doing it? To well, me, you, it's these scientists are, are thinking long term, and I think that's amazing. Well, you got that great moment too in the film when, when um, one of the scientists, I believe, travels to Washington. Mm -hmm. And or or the director actually of the program uh, travels and the, the 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 politician something along the lines of I mean it's a little hard to talk about solutions or or end games or monitoring and evaluation when you know we're talking about a twenty year project but really this is this is even longer in a, in a sense yeah so, so this project the is scope of the project is 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 grand somebody says in the film but it's gargantuan really. <laughs> Because this project is a piece in a puzzle of the grand project. Sure. So sure. this 25-year machine is a, a building block. And this is the ITER machine. Yeah, ITER. So it's a building block. It's, it's the most expensive uh, scientific experiment ever conducted. 
the biggest construction challenge. You know, 37 countries gorgeous, working together. Gorgeous photography, by the way. Building it all over the world and yeah. shipping it to the south of France and assembling it there. So you have China, Russia, USA, Europe, Korea, everybody working together yeah. Yeah. on the most complex machine. Um, so it's something that you can't just tinker with midstream, you know, and say, oh, actually, we're not going to pay this year. You know, one country right. pulls out. Right. The whole thing, it's a house of cards, you know. Right. Or I, I like to think a Tower of Babel. Right. <laughs> you know, right. it really sure, is sure. not something, it's something you really have to be rigorous with, with. It's like, it's also the most difficult political concept you can imagine, I think. Yeah. Because it's like we don't we don't do anything on a on a world government well, scale. Well, we don't we don't play well together, right? I mean, you yeah. don't have to look too far in the news right now to see that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look yesterday, hundred years ago. Look, you know, it just yeah, we we uh, it's about exclusion. Well, right. It's, I would say there is something quite in encouraging about me seeing how Europe works. Yeah. Europe good. has kind of figured Brexit aside, uh, although the scientists from England are still in the project. But they figured out something since World War II that is pretty unique. Like those countries do work really well together and they sort of embrace the bureaucracy. They're like, it's going to be bureaucratic, but we're going to have rules and we're going to have across the board change for good in a way. Sure. That's to sure, say. Sure. And it's very different. And Americans don't, they like the single cowboy kind of concept. Right. Like, we'll do this ourselves or you guys can have your messy, you know, game together. And it's... Playing together is interesting because that's how you can have projects that are more elaborate and more risky. What I loved about this was too was how you show us that the complexity of it, the nuances and the subtleties, the importance, but also that it's publicly funded. Yes. This is a publicly funded thing. This is not about uh, uh, IBM yeah. know, getting behind this project or, or, or whatever, some university. How, how could they ever do it? The scale and the scope are just too huge. Mm -hmm. But I love that it's, uh, it's publicly funded it's all of us. Yeah. It's kind of, I think, NASA takes that kind of role, or space, da space agencies take that role, where they say, this is pure kind of research, science, exploration. At a certain point, we'll get it to the point where it becomes commercially viable. And then we won't do it anymore, and the right. private sector will move in and build, you know, they'll, you know SpaceX will make rockets once it's, a, it's, it's at that level. And I think fusion is like that. Nobody's going to spend all the R&D and go bankrupt spending billions of dollars proving the concept. The public has to do that if they want it. And then once that's proven, it's like the Wright Brothers plane. Yes. You know, you'll have 50 years later a Boeing 747. But you're, Boeing's not going to start from scratch sure, and, and prove sure. that you can fly. Sure, sure. There's a great shot. I think that his name was Michel, maybe? Michel uh, Laberge. Yeah. And uh, the, the shop, uh, he's, he's talking about his uh, approach. And you, you show various approaches to this, I guess, solution uh, that everyone in the film is really trying to work towards, this fusion. Um, re would you call it a reactor? This space where fusions, where yeah, it's an experimental reactor. An experimental reactor, um, but I love the shot because behind him is just it. It looks like he's just he's walked into a Home Depot that's exploded, <laughs> <laughs> right? The, the 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 tubes and the wires and the the darkness and it's just what a mess. I mean, what a beautiful metaphor for how how complicated this whole thing really. I mean, it's like a magic trick. Yeah, in a way. How do you, what is it, 150 million degrees centigrade? Yeah, it's like, so it's 10 times harder than the sun. It's just, I mean, I, I, I laughed out loud when I heard that number. <laughs> How's it even possible? It is impossible in a way that it would, you can't build a machine that will contain that with any material on earth because right, it right. would melt, it would melt a car in seconds, sure. right? It yep. would melt anything. There's sure. nothing we yep. can contain with. Yep. Yep. So the only way they can contain that heat is by building a magnetic field. So the, the plasma that they're generating, you know, like the inside of the sun, it's all kept in place by magnets. And so they have to build the world's most complex magnets to do that. So I find that really, I really nerd out in that kind of stuff. <laughs> so are you just big, one big nerd? Like, did you love uh, uh, playing with test tubes and Bunsen burners in, in high school? Like, you know what? I wasn't, I was never a science guy. Like, yeah. I hated physics class and I hated I chemistry. Hated, I hated physics too. Yeah, I think they didn't explain it well. Because, like, I like learning. I have the privilege over the last few years of learning plasma physics from a couple of the best world leaders in the in the field. That's sure, what sure. privilege as a filmmaker. Sure. And patient guys, you know. Yeah. Like most of the physicists I met in the job were also like, like they didn't want to explain things to me. They yeah. just wanted to cut yeah. to what they were fascinated with. But Mark and Michelle, they were like patient, you know, like they're basically Bill Nye type guys who just want yes. you to get the concept. Sure. Yeah. And it's really fun. Like very few people, I think, have high school physics teachers like that. 
I, I, I want to talk about this, uh, the notion of collaboration in the film, scientific and political and social, because I think it comes out so beautifully and it's a thread that runs throughout. But what, you're sitting here now, the film's played at various festivals, you've answered a lot of Q&As, I'm sure you've, I, I would imagine you've read a few reviews. Uh, what's your take on the film now? Because to me, this is a film about, sure, it's about science, but this is about discovery. This is about the way we do science. This is about how it's funded. This is about pol political collaboration and about getting along and about about um, the social change and the environment. It's about climate. It's about everything. It's it's brilliant. Like any great doc film to me, is, is has got works on so many different levels. For you, director, writer, producer, etc. How do how do you explain this to a group of students? You mean. Oh, the, the, before the, they see it? Here's, hey, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good. Um, yeah, yeah. How do I explain it? Um, it's kind of not your normal science film. And that's, I realize that's one of my dilemmas in, the, in putting the film out there. I don't usually make science films, and I didn't try to fit the genre in this one. And so people are expecting a certain kind of film they'll see on Discovery or something like that. And that's fine. I mean, you learn a lot from those. And But to me, this is a really... This is what's behind the science and what drives somebody to be obsessed with something that is world-changing. And, and also, how to get inspired in something that can change the world. So, I don't think a lot of people go into it expecting that kind of film. It's almost like a science fiction film. It's almost like seeing... It, it kind of is. I, I love it. And by the way, folks, uh, uh, me listening here wearing a War of the Worlds t-shirt. So <laughs> it's uh, how appropriate. Was that planned? Uh, yeah. It was not planned. That's very funny. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's, like, it's actually playing at a couple science fiction film festivals. It played at Fantasia in Montreal and one in Italy called the Science Plus Fiction Film Festival. Well, it's so interesting. And, and you, uh, I want to come back to that question about what is the film for you thematically? You know, Because it touches on so many things that are so important, right? To, to My kids are 9 and 20. It's important to their generation, you know. As as one of the guys says, I, I'm like the cathedral maker. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to see the cathedral finish because it's going to take a hundred years to build. Yeah. Um, but but I love I love this social and political collaboration that and community, right? But the science fiction to me, it, it's just a comment on how science we think science is done, but we're watching these guys building this thing, and then some of your other guys who have no it seems like no idea what they're doing and they're really just throwing darts against the wall like this it's really interesting the mystery the wonder the the discovery of it all well i mean that's the, another thing you learn about science when you really dig into it is science is about getting things wrong most of the time <laughs> that's because a great line. they you they really they they're trying to cover all the bases yep they're basically saying this doesn't work this doesn't work this doesn't work and eventually they stumble onto something that works and they have no focus in some times, they're just going out there and stabbing. They don't have this grand plan of what's... Yeah. What, uh, like, they can't... It's unlike storytellers who can't force their narrative on the world. They have to accept what the world is and figure it out. And figure it out. And so they're pretty humble in that. And it's like, they're, ha they're having fun. That's the other thing about science I learned in this. They would go through the most boring kind of meeting and talk about magnets or whatever. And then one of the guys would turn to me. He's like, can you believe I'm getting paid for this? A job that I love? I'm like, I can believe you're getting paid for this. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, tedious. Yeah. They're in love with it. Yeah. That's what's really cool. Yeah. And to get jump back to science fiction for a sec. What I, I love science fiction, I would say, more than I love science movies. But what I always find dissatisfying about them is that the climax of the movie or the message of the movie is never about the science being good or hopeful or something like that. It's always about some petty like rivalry between two men d derailing everything. It's right. always some right. human failing. Sure. Yeah. Or it's about a dystopia created by the science. Right. And it's like, I kind of like to have the turn on it where it's like you get past that. And I think in this film, there's a hopeful message because you can get past... It's very hopeful. You can get past the sort of squabblings if you try. So let's talk about those squabblings. Let's talk about the Cold War-like squabblings. Fascinating part mm -hmm. of the story for me. And I love the way you use animation, too, in the film. It's really interesting and quite engaging. But the, the, where, where do the Russians play into this? Because they clearly play in in a big way. And it seems to me you present them in such a way that says they were the ones that were willing to include in a way that maybe the West wasn't. It sort of means a parallel Cold War story that nobody really knows about. So they came up with this idea for the machine that's being built in the south of France in the 1940s, uh, yeah, late 40s. Basically, it was a self-taught army soldier in, in the remote island of Sakhalin in, uh, like, off the coast. It's like a penal colony. And 
he came up with a concept and sent it right to Joseph Stalin, like mm. like a mail mm. to his desk. Mm. He was ignored. He sent it again, and then the second time Stalin actually read it, scooped up this guy and made him explain everything to his leading nuclear scientists. And he actually diverted um, Sakharov, Sakharov, Nobel Peace Prize winning physicist. He was in charge of nuclear weapons. This guy diverted his path towards fusion. And, fu and fusion is a peaceful kind of use of, sure. of, of that technology. And there's something about it. Because you're using not uranium or plutonium as the fuel, you're using seawater as the fuel, it's not weaponizable. It's not like you're going to be worried about having access to seawater for the Iranians or, or North Koreans. Right. It's, everybody has access right. to it. Right. And in the, the, the amounts of what they're doing, it's you, like there's nothing you can do to make this into a weapon. So the, the Soviets saw the benefit of this and every, at the time, everything nuclear was under complete embargo. If you're an American researcher, you can talk to your wife about what you're doing. There were secret cities built up around the States and in Russia about nuclear. And overnight, the Russians said, we are, we are inviting you all to come see what we're working on in our nuclear fusion uh, reactor. And the, the Americans went from not being able to talk about it with anybody to traveling to Russia and having the Russians travel to like UK and US and share openly what they were working on. And it was amazing. This was in the 50s at the height of the Cold War. And nobody knew about it. Well, well think, some some people clearly I, did, but I don't know if people cared because maybe. it was kind of like, what is going on here? Like they didn't get the end game for right, it. Right. But really, that those that machine, you know, has been playing around and, and, and growing and stuff. The machine they're building now was signed into existence by Reagan and Gorbachev right. in their first meeting at, in Geneva. They couldn't agree on anything. They said we have to give the world something, and they agreed on to build Eater in the 80s, and they're finally finishing it now. I think that's amazing. It's utterly brilliant is what it is, and I love the, and I'm sure you went through a fair bit of archival footage, but I love the line when Reagan responds to the, the, the journalist, I'm always optimistic. Yeah. Is that you? Is that you? <laughs> Are you always optimistic? Oh, yeah, I think I am. <laughs> I don't see, I don't see, I don't think I see any cynicism in this film at all. Yeah, I, I, like the worst I can be, I think, is sarcastic, and I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I love irony, right? Okay, so I, yep. there's a lot of moments in the film that sure. are kind of like a little bit absurd. But sure, sure. I think overly, how can you not be optimistic? It's like, the, you, you know, you see the possibilities in the world. And it's like, yeah, you know, bad things happen. But you can certainly push things in a good direction. Well, isn't this an argument for, for doing the right thing? <laughs> For, for, for spending a little more time on, on making some the, some of these important decisions, for for, be, for figuring out how to work with others. Yeah. That we are in this together. That we, we, we live in a, I don't know, we live in an inclusive universe, it seems to me. And yet, you know, let's put, pull up BBC or Al Jazeera right now and it's not going to look too inclusive. Exactly, yeah. It's going to look, it's going to look a little more like we're, 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 going, we're going on the inside. We're going insular. Mm-hmm. I think there's a focus on things in the news and everything on conflict. That's what drives stories, yep. I would say. It's like, yep. what's going on here that we have to worry about? But if you over-focus on that, then it's like you get a really skewed view of the world and everybody's just scared all the time. And I think that's completely unnecessary. I love uh, how you also, uh, I, I, and, and help me out with the context here, but, uh, and I think it's the project that's going on in Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody says, this wouldn't have been possible without the reunion. Of Germany. Yeah. Reunification. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it's really cool. You don't see a lot of those positive stories either, yeah, you know? Like, yeah. uh, who remembers even now the repercussions after the Berlin Wall sure. fell? It was yeah. just all about freedom and whatever. But the Eastern side had a very heavily trained science corps, right? They had, they had, more, they had advanced scientists who had to go somewhere. And so they built this, and it, it, it would have fallen apart. The world did not help them build that machine in the same way. Um, let's talk as we, we come to a close, sadly. Uh, tell me a little bit about, from your sense, you know, you learned, you, you started not knowing what this was all about, either. You never heard of it, like me, till today, basically. I'm sure I've heard of it, mm -hmm. but I've never paid any attention to it. That's probably what's happened in my past. Uh, talk, can you tell me a little bit about that potential, you know? This, I mean, that what... What does if there was a dystopic edge to the film, what comes out is if we don't do something, we're kind of screwed. You and I may not see that. Our kids might. Their kids probably will. And you've got this great scene near the end where the scientist is talking to the construction workers, and they're a part of this, and they don't really know the implications. 
And they he, don't know what they're building. They don't know what they're building. And he, and he talks about the bucket of water being, what is it? One liter of that will equal to 350 liters of oil. Yeah. That's astounding. Yeah. Astounding. Back to our big lump of coal. And the sun wasn't the lump of coal that we thought it was. Let's get off those fossil fuels, folks. Yeah, that's the sort of dr- driving of the film that's kind of dy- dystopic, is that solar is cool, wind is cool, all the renewables, all that stuff is, is a nice sort of mix of stuff that is replacing small percentages, right? We're just sort of eating into the 77% of fossil fuels out there that really drive the world. And even if solar doubles or triples in the next couple of years, then you're looking at like 3% of, of energy use. I don't mean, just mean home electricity, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean all mm-hmm, energy. Mm-hmm. So we need something to replace, do the heavy lifting to replace uh, fossil fuels, not now, but I mean, at least 100 years from now. And so our, our civilization can last, you know, another 100 years, 200 years, but it can't last 1,000 years at current goals. And who, when are we going to think of, of that kind of end game? Can it even last 100 years? Can it last 200 years? We don't really know. And we don't have a plan B. Fusion does offer the most astounding plan B that all science fiction writers know every spaceship is going to have to have fusion power. It's a given right? Star Trek, all these guys, and a lot of the people working in Eater wanted to design rocket ships at the beginning. Oh, okay. They all, I kept okay. meeting rocket ship designers who were like, ah, but it was a bit too early, so I decided to make fusion energy. Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh, thanks, guys. Yeah. But it was like, in long term of humanity, it's weird to say now, but we're going to need fusion energy for a lot of things. And all the other components are part of the pie, but fossil fuels hopefully will not be in that hey, way. Is there, it just made me think of something before we wrap up here. Uh, does it, is it possible? I mean, do we know if it could be weaponized? Well, you can make a fusion bomb, absolutely. Right. They've made them before. It's just you need an atomic bomb, a plutonium bomb, to trigger that bomb first. Oh, I see. So okay. it's like the helium... I'm, I'm kind of glad I don't know that. <laughs> the hydrogen kind of is the kicker. It's like right. a double bomb, oh, right? okay. So they can make that bomb, it's, but what they're building here is not that at it's all. It's like the caffeine in Advil. <laughs> Yeah, we could get worse with those drug analogies, I guess. Yeah, yeah we could very much so, yeah. Well, um, I love to, I just, wow, you just sort of bookended it. Oh, yeah, by the way, all the all the God's Eye View drone-like footage is absolutely gorgeous. It was uh, so much fun filming that. We would I just go off into the French countryside stunning. and play around. Oh, man, you clearly had a lot of fun, and you came out with some gorgeous images. I mean, beautiful metaphors, too. I mean, Good. a couple of them, just absolutely stunning. Um, tell me a little bit, as we wrap up, about the last song. <laughs> in the film, the grassroots song, the the live, uh, what is it called? Live. Uh, Let's live, live for today. Let's live for today. Could yeah. you have written a better song? Yeah, and Fifth, and what is that? 50, 60? 60, 60 like years. late sixties, I think. Yeah, sixty-seven, I think. Yeah. yeah, probably the most expensive song I've ever licensed, but I think it was <laughs> worth it. A lot of people of a certain generation are so happy to use that song, and then but the scientists are like, "Hey, uh, did you mean that? Mean that song ironically?" <laughs> And I was like, yeah, it's supposed to be ironic. And they're like, good, I get it. It's oh, so funny. That, oh, that's very funny. Yeah. And yeah. I should add, you were talking about the drone footage. I should add the co-director yeah. and cinematographer is Van Royko. And he, he and I really did a really fun collaboration on this. He was a cinematographer, but he actually learned as much about the physics. And so he became a co-director because he could engage the phys- physicist as much or more than I could because he got so into the subject matter. But also, we would just have fun creating these weird shots to make the film interesting. Because the film could have been pretty visually very dull also. Well, it's anything but, and I hope everyone gets to see it. I truly do. I hope it, it doesn't uh, sit on a shelf somewhere, but it's uh, uh, opening up minds in, in, in schools around the world. It's, it's, uh, I'm assuming it's going to be translated in uh, many languages. I it guess. already has been. Oh, it's been excellent. Pl- the Fantastic. Fusion Labs themselves have been getting it translated, so it's already in like amazing. six, seven languages. Oh, that's amazing. Mila, thank you so much for your time today. What a pleasure chatting with you. I'm uh, maybe, maybe part two in the future. Uh, yeah, 2025, I plan to be there when they turn it on. Is that right, eh? Good, good for you. Let There Be Light, Mila Ang Thuin, uh, his new film, uh, talking here today in Toronto about a film that hopefully you're going to get to see in the very near future. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.